Where are you from? Back east. From where back east? Different places. We need to talk about Showgirls. Have you ever seen a movie so tone deaf, so exploitative, and so misguided that you can't help but ask, is this on purpose? No? Well then you've never seen Showgirls, the 1995 classic brought to you by the director of Robocop, the screenwriter of Flashdance, and your favorite feminist queen from Saved by the Bell. This box office failure was so widely panned by critics and viewers alike that it broke the record for Razzie nominations the following year and single-handedly destroyed Elizabeth Berkley's career. And am I about to argue that it's a cynical masterpiece about the chew em up and spit em out showbiz machine? Man, everybody got AIDS and shit. No. I'm gonna get it out now and shut down the insinuation that Showgirls is some sort of intellectual experiment, purely because it's too easy to defend a bad film by saying, you just didn't get it. If the case was that this film is an astute commentary on the industry, it would have had to have flown over the heads of just about everyone who watched it in 1995. It would also be wildly hypocritical considering it's, in the words of Quentin Tarantino, a big budget sexploitation movie. But in this video, I will be making the rather radical claim that the movie can be redeemed only if we accept it for what it truly is. Pure, unadulterated camp. If you haven't seen it, Showgirls is about an aspiring dancer named Nomi Malone and her journey through the harsh, exploitative world of Las Vegas. Along the way, she makes some friends, a few lovers, and many enemies. Starting out at a sleazy but endearing strip club called The Cheetah, we follow Nomi as she sheds her troubled past and ascends her way to the apex of a spectacular topless dance show at the Stardust Hotel. But this isn't without screwing over basically everyone she meets to get there. In the same vein as other showbiz morality tales like All About Eve and Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, this film is pretty on the nose with its message. You gotta sell yourself body and soul if you want to win in this world. But the sheer amount of strange and uncanny elements of the movie simply overpowers and distracts from the cautionary tale Verhoeven set out to create. On top of the gratuitous nudity and violence, this quick compilation of perplexing dialogue should tell you exactly why audiences were both confused and offended by the film. Where are the chips? Mm -hmm. You ate them, didn't you? Mm-mm. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Yes, you did! <laughs> you did! Uh -huh. You did! <gasps> she can dance, can't she? Man, everybody got AIDS and shit. God damn it. You're the only one who could get my tits popping right. Oh, I used to love doggy chow. <laughs> I used to love doggy chow, too. Must be weird not having anybody come on you. I like a lot of different champagnes. But I always stick with champagne. I like nice tits. <laughs> I always have. How about you? I was having my period, Al. You don't want me to get blood all over the place. Nice dress. Thanks. I bought it at Versace. It's Versace. I love it. But in recent years, it's come to be something of a cult classic, particularly amongst critics and queer communities. This era of rehabilitation has led to many people reframing the showgirl's narrative as a misunderstood satire of American culture and sexual exploitation. Even the director, Paul Verhoeven, has stated, Vegas is a city that is totally hyperbolic, exaggerated left, right, and center. I felt that the movie should replicate that in some way, and that's why everything has that exaggerated quality. That sense of exaggeration was used by many critics against the film, especially against the actresses, but it was our intention. When we consider Verhoeven's repertoire, it's no secret that he's a lover of melodrama. Think about his most successful films, Robocop, Total Recall, Basic Instinct, and Starship Troopers, all of which contain a level of ridiculousness, but they can also read as parables about contemporary society. And critic Jonathan Rosenbaum seems to see Showgirls as another parable in the Verhoeven canon. He states, 
The critics hooted it off the screen as a piece of camp, just as many of them, including me, had dismissed the previous Verhoeven Esterhaus sex movie, Basic Instinct, as a hoot. I now believe that both pictures hold up much better than anything we said at the time would have suggested. Showgirls has to be one of the most vitriolic allegories about Hollywood and selling out ever made, and both films are undeniably sexy to boot. So on the one hand, you have Verhoeven defending the film on the basis of its artificiality, and on the other hand, you have critics defending the film against its campy facade. So is it camp? Let's go back in time. In 1964, Susan Sontag published an essay in the Partisan Review called Notes on Camp. In it, Sontag enumerates the many definitions of camp, which she argues is a word with a kind of fugitive sensibility, one of those terms that can never be cohesively described. In the short of it, Sontag defines camp as a certain mode of aestheticism. It's one way of seeing the world as an aesthetic phenomenon. That way, the way of camp, is not in terms of beauty, but in terms of the degree of artifice, of stylization. So within these terms, Showgirls ostensibly fits the definition of camp. But it doesn't end there. Sontag's definition expands for another 13 pages. And this is what makes the term so elusive, it's difficult to pin down. That's why when the 2019 Met Gala made its theme Camp Notes on Fashion in a nod to Sontag's essay, very, very few celebrities got it right. The sharpest line Sontag draws is between what she calls deliberate camp and naive camp. Deliberate camp, she says, is a camp which knows itself to be camp. How? I am Pocahontas, a Chippewa maiden. I'm Indian. Enough said. <laughs> and I am running bear, betrothed to Pocahontas. In the play. 20 grand for summer camp. He's Mr. Woo Woo. This kind is less satisfying. We can think of deliberate camp as a work that assumes a level of smarm, one that gives a giant wink to its audience as if to say, don't you love how silly this is? Based on this distinction, we can see why the costumes of the Met Gala don't exactly fit the bill, because the guests went in with the intention of dressing outrageous and surreal. Camp isn't so much a thing you put on or put a face to, Rather, it's an attitude or behavior or disposition, at least according to Sontag. Another example of deliberate camp would be, and you can disagree with me here, really anything by Baz Luhrmann. Think of Romeo plus Juliet. The movie is outrageous. The costumes are nods to the zeitgeist of 90s America. The Shakespearean dialogue is shouted and screamed throughout the entire film. It's artificial and extravagant and self-aware, yes, but for some reason, it doesn't necessarily leave you with the same nostalgic feeling as a film like Reefer Madness or Batman and Robin or even Twilight. That's because these movies fall within the naive or pure category, which is described by Sontag as the sensibility of failed seriousness, of the theatricalization of experience. Marijuana, the burning weed with its roots in hell. So this is where we get to our burning question. If satire knows its satire, and camp does not know its camp, what is Showgirls? I think this tension between satire and camp can be distilled into the film's two main actresses. Gina Gershon, who plays Crystal, seems to know what kind of movie she's in. Every line she delivers is embellished with a smirk, and her calm but conniving demeanor is incredibly self-aware and premedicated. Elizabeth Berkley, on the other hand, well, I play a very ambitious, desirous woman who comes from a mysterious past. Right. And I'm fueled by my ambition because I want to go to Vegas and become a showgirl. Uh -huh. and what of course, Berkeley also bore the brunt of criticism and ridicule that the film received, which resulted in her being dropped by her agent and rejected by others soon after. In the ensuing years, Paul Verhoeven has taken the blame for Berkeley's tanked career and maintains that her over-the-top, thrashy, yelly performance was a product of his direction, that he intentionally asked her to play Nomi that way. But even if we take Verhoeven's retrospective comments and Gershon's wink-wink, nudge-nudge delivery to heart, there's something about Berkeley's presence in this film that's so earnest. Every time she squeals or flops around like a fish or slams a box of fries, she does it with such honesty that you can't help but appreciate her effort. And who could blame her for joining a film like this? After Verhoeven's success with Basic Instinct, which propelled Sharon Stone to superstardom, this seemed like the perfect opportunity for Berkeley to shed her good girl image. 
And it's this bright-eyed excitement, this eagerness to learn about the women in the industry and be involved in something gritty and serious that adds a sort of dual nature to Berkeley's role. And this is where I think showgirls can be redeemed. If we look at all the other aspects of the film, the gaudy Las Vegas backdrop, Kyle MacLachlan's man bangs, the shamelessly sleazy club owner, we kind of know what the film is trying to be, a satire about the exploitation of women in the industry, or as Jacques Rivette puts it, it's about surviving in a world populated by assholes. But once you add Elizabeth Berkley, whose star was fresh out of corny, all-American sitcom territory, the ambiance of the film changes entirely. Chon Noriga, a professor from UCLA, says, Berkeley's performance consistently stands out from the narrative proper. We're aware of watching a former television child actor do her own dance, lap dance, and striptease numbers, but we're also aware of watching her act. And it's this naivete that redeems the film as pure unadulterated camp. But when it comes down to it, I don't think Showgirls is a brilliant film. Its tone is all over the place, the script is weird, and its sentiment towards sex work is, well, dated. If it's at the cheetah, it's not dancing, I know that much. You dance like when you fucked that guy last night. What guy? That guy with the chick. You took him in the back. I didn't fuck him. Yeah, you did. You fucked him and her. Denver, soliciting. Stop San it! Jose, soliciting. Cheyenne, soliciting. Shall I read you the rest of them? Why did you stop hooking? You had your future pretty well mapped out for yourself. Not the whore. In fact, even after interviewing hundreds of strippers and Vegas dancers before production, many of these people came out and said the film was not accurate in the slightest. And while there are definitely elements that reveal its satirical qualities, whether or not it's a successful satire is another question altogether. But the reason it keeps popping up in film discourse is just that. It's tough to know where Showgirls succeeds. All I can say is that while Showgirls may not have succeeded as a satire necessarily, its role as a camp phenomenon does. While Nomi's arc as a Showgirl may read as artificial and lack believability, Elizabeth Berkeley's arc as an actor does not. She joined this production with wide-eyed intensity, laid it all to bear, and was publicly humiliated for it. It's a pretty sinister parallel between what the movie was attempting to say about show business and what actually happened to Berkeley, who was tossed around and spit out by the industry as a result. As Chon Nariga put it, sincerity is the sacrificial lamb of satire. In Showgirls, Berkeley's blood is everywhere. Sontag's essay is a love letter to camp, a defense of its elusiveness, its low culture sensibility, and its failed seriousness. And even though Showgirls comes with a myriad of its own problems, it deserves to be defended for the very same reasons. Its embrace of the gaudy and shallow can be attributed to Verhoeven, sure, but the film truly owes its camp title to Berkeley, whose ultimate sacrifice will allow us to embrace the film for decades to come. And maybe once we've embraced it in all its innocent campiness, we can finally say that we're no longer laughing at it, but laughing with it.